Right. Um, this week, we're going to be looking at Erdinger from Germany. However, to start with, we're going to be hopping over to Joe on the hot topic, uh, looking at some interesting news about Brixton Brewery. Yeah, so hot off the press here in the UK is the purchase of a minority stake in Brixton Brewery by none other than Heineken. Brixton Brewery is, you know, we, we haven't done an episode on Brixton Brewery yet, but we will do. But it's a very local favourite, obviously coming from southwest London, you know, south south London of Brixton. So obviously it's a local favourite here in south London, uh, Brixton Brewery. And, you know, it, the, the fact that Heineken, a big, big player like Heineken, has taken such an interest and is willing to put their money where their mouth is in a company like Brixton Brewery shows that, you know, what we know as a local jewel, local talent here in, you know, in south London of, of Brixton, should be shipped and, and known to the world. Like, Heineken is going to give them, even though it's a minority stake, so, uh, you know, Jez and Libby Galen, you know, these are a couple, you know, a, a married couple that started Brixton Brewery. Again, we haven't done Brixton Brewery yet, but we will do. Fantastic background story to that, so watch this space for a Brixton Brewery episode. The fact that they are still in control, they're still a majority stakeholders in the company. The fact that Heineken is just is putting money behind them, but is not r- ruling the roost at Brixton Brewery is music to I think everyone's ears. We don't want to see a company like Brixton Brewery at this stage where they're still developing, they're still growing. You know, they've been around since 2013, so an eight year cycle right now, but that still is early days. I mean, we've heard very recently, like, you know, obviously Camden Brewery getting bought out by AB and Bev. Uh, you know, we're hearing these big names that are kind of being taken, uh, or, you know, Frontier is, you know, from the Fuller's Brewery is now part of the, the Asahi group. You know, we're hearing a lot of these like local staples here in London kind of being taken up and have interest by the big, big players. So I'm just very pleased personally that uh, a company is still its own, but has some b- more financial backing. Rich, go. Oh, I was just going to say, it's just nice for a brewery to be able to keep its individuality. Because we see so many of these breweries over time kind of lose it slightly that when they get brought up by a bigger by a bigger company, by a bigger brewery, it kind of takes the individuality away. And it's nice to see Brixton Brewery kind of still being able to own it, still being able to put out those little bits and bobs and still kind of feel like a I suppose like a smallish business and that there but it's nice to see that there's a there is like kind of like a recommendation or accommodation that they that they are destined for bigger and better things but they're not being sold out completely it's kind of more of like a slow build towards greatness i think would be the way to put it if if i'm honest i can interject a little bit i would slightly disagree that like i i, I get what you're the sentiment you're saying in that like you don't want a, a big company just to come in and it just to feel like it's a big company now and, and you've lost that kind of local hero as it were in a local area but I think what these these bigger companies are doing so smartly now in the, over the last five years is they are taking these local gems, those smaller breweries, but still making them feel like they're still independent. I mean, look at Camden. Camden is owned by the biggest beer company in the world. And yet we had to find that out by looking, doing the research for the podcast. You had no idea. We, I had no idea that, Cam, that Camden Town was owned by AB and Bev until we did the research on it. Isn't that the same with Mean Time as well? Yeah, the fact that they're owned by or they have controlling rights by Asahi, you know, the Japanese, the Japanese, like the third largest brewery in the world, but like the, the Japanese uh, conglomerate is news to us. That's a new news. And um, the one thing I would say is like, I don't, for me, this situation that, that they found themselves in is only a good thing. And I think we, it should be seen as, do you know what? This means that there potentially is bigger and better things to come from Brixton. So. You can see it. I think some people would see it as, oh, they're selling their soul a little bit because they just want the money. It's like, no, they're realizing that by getting that extra investment, they can develop themselves more and they, they might come out with some more interesting beers and like there might be some more interesting investment that comes around Brixton itself. And I think you can't, that can never hurt, especially in this situation where, as you said, it's a minor investment, minor being the, like as in, it's it's not going to be minor. It's going to be a lot of money involved. But the fact that it's gonna it's only going to help flush them a little bit better. And this isn't a new thing that Heineken and and uh, 
and Brixton have been in partnership or had some level of communications. I mean, behind the scenes, Brixton and Heineken have been working together for years now. You know, specifically the last three years that they've been, Brixton have been leveraging Heineken's expertise in, and market reach to, you know, help grow the, the Brixton brand and grow their, like, kind of, they put their beer out there. So, you know, I think there's, there's a, this, this kind of the, the announcement that Heineken is putting money into Brixton is really just to kind of showcase the fact that there already is a relationship there between these two companies. And I think what we're getting across is that Brixton is a fantastic organization that we'll, we'll do in a podcast, but we don't want to see that lost. And thankfully, I would have to say that I'm, I'm for this because we have seen with the likes of Camden and we saw with the likes of Meantime getting bought out by Asahi in that these companies can still be backed by bigger organ- brewery organization. That's going to happen, but they can still keep their individuality and they keep what makes them special. So across the board, I think we're with we're, 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 looking forward to this what to see what happens next with the next life cycle and stage of bricks and brewery right in this week's pursuit of hoppiness we are donning our lederhosen and traveling to bavaria for erdinger weissbier he hoffed and he puffed and he signed an eviction notice great shrek quote always a big fan of the shrek quotes thank you thank you thank you have you guys ever worn lederhosen before I wish I had. I wish like my answer to that is yes. I've spent the money because Lederhosen, as I know it, if you're not from Germany or Bavaria specifically, you've probably been introduced to Lederhosen if you've tried to go to uh, to Oktoberfest in the past because that is kind of like mandatory wear to wear your Lederhosen and to go and don it on. But Lederhosen is like a legit like traditional dress. It's expensive as well. Oh yeah, yeah. I can definitely say the one I purchased was probably not as traditional as we'll say a traditional lederhosen but i did but i did the october fest that came to the isle of wight and um i might have donned a lederhosen for that oh yeah of course that well-known october fest the october fest in the isle of wight you have to on the week that this podcast comes out you have to put an image of you in your lederhosen <laughs> i will i will try and dig it out or find an image of me and being my lederhosen Thinking about Erdinger and like you, like obviously everyone's thinking about Oktoberfest and Erdinger as like because it's German. As in, for me, Erdinger links me straight to my hockey tour at uni where I went to Berlin, and it was something that was very easily accessible and I'd never experienced. Like I'd never had Erdinger before. Um, I didn't even realize what a wheat beer was. So it said, oh, we're a wheat beer. We're the biggest wheat beer brewery in the world sort of thing. And I had no idea what that actually meant. For The difference between a wheat beer and a normal beer is the fact that most beer is barley and rye and has ingredients like rice and corn in it, whilst a wheat beer has to be at least 50% wheat which I think is completely different to what you're normally used to. Which, So going back to like wheat years, you absolutely hit the nail on the head in the difference. Obviously, it's very wheat derivative based beer. It's called a wheat beer, a vice beer, wheat beer, German wheat beer. But I think what's fascinating about this is Erdinger in itself is a, is a classic German wheat beer, uh, you know, or vice beer as it's referred to. You know, it's, it's got a, so many different arrays of aromas and flavors. Um, you know, it's still brewed by Erdinger in the heart of Bavaria. And it has that kind of capture of the traditional sense of like the pale body capped with an abundant creamy white head. And I think if, you know, I've poured this out into the, into a glass so you guys can see. It is beautiful. And I will say that in very, like, I am a, such a fan of a wheat beer in that, you know, it's color, it's coloration. I think there are so many beers that, you know, look are very tasty, but function, but don't look great. They're more functional. Whereas an Erdinger, Vice beer is beautiful in that setting, in just ha- the coloration, putting up against the light, the, ha- the fact that how the orange is and the different kind of scents that come through it, and then you start putting your nose to it. Oh my word! I'm just transported to the what uh, the only time I've ever been to Germany, and a family trip to where we met with my Australian cousins in Berlin, and I have to say that I drank nothing but Vice beer while I was there, and it was a phenomenal experience. I, I just cannot rate it enough. It's inter- really interesting because obviously you're talking about how good it is and you forget how old this company is. So it started in 1886. It's uh, over 130 years old. It, in 2016, it celebrated its 130 years of operation. And the fact that in 2019, 
it sold over 1.7 million hectoliters of its beer. Like this is such a big company and it, the product is so like, it sort of feels perfected to me. Like it's so good. Like I've had other wheat beers and I've been disappointed with the flavor, but this one just hits the right like pocket for me. Well, that's it. It, it feels so, well, you said it's been going for how, how, how many years, Sino? So in 2016, it celebrated its 130 years of operation. So over 130 years. Well, that's mad. 130 years. You, you, well, you'd assume they'd have got the recipe right and they'd have nailed the marketing and everything like that. But it, it's, it's fantastic to hear a beer that is steeped in that much tradition as well. And that, that goes down to like when I've, the, this is the first time I've tried Erdinger, which is oh, right now I've, I've tried other other wheat beers. I think the first one was when me and you, Joe, were in Amsterdam with Matt, and we tried some wheat beers when we were in the in the tram station. We tried a really nice wheat beer that 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 was in there. It was really good that you brought that up because there is a difference between a a German Weiss beer and a Dutch Wit beer. So it's very from the same derivative of like fifty percent of the wheat, but it's just very different, slightly different takes on it. So Erdinger is through and through the German side of it, whereas if if you've had like a Hogarden before, that is very much the Dutch version of a Witbier. Okay, well yeah, it, yeah. It's, oh well, that's well, that's good to know. As I said, every day is a school day, uh, and I like this. But 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 what I've really really enjoyed is um is is the design on the actual bottle we've we've seen a lot of these new craft breweries and stuff like that are coming with these incredibly funky incredibly picturesque that clearly employed an artist graphic designers to create something that's fantastic but what erdinger does is they've gone very simple and very subtle was like the, you've got the main erdinger logo which clearly has a wheat in the middle of it, which clearly is wheat in the middle of it. They're showing what they're named for. They're showing what they're passionate for. But in general, the whole design is very, very simple and um, simplistic, but it works because it's very, very recognisable at the same time. Now that I've seen it, now that we've spoken about it, I will always know what an Erdinger is, what an Erdinger beer does. Um, I actually find it interesting as well. Like They're very proud to be Bavarian rather than German in itself. So they, they are really giving a homage to the fact that they are Bavarian. So as in like, I'm not sure if you've got this on your bottle, like the extra middle like line that says Bavarian double maturity method. So it's the fact that they're really giving a homage to the fact that where they have come from. And it's really cool that they steep, it's almost like they're steeping their bottle in history. And I really like that. Well, I think actually the location that it's from Bavaria is so important to this brand because it's like champagne. We talked about champagne in the recent podcast in that you can only get a proper champagne from the champagne region in France. It's protected because of that's where you get it from. And wheat beer in this essence, in the German Weiss beer style, it's true through and through Bavarian. Right, you know, if you go up to Berlin, you go up to, you know, kind of the northern, like Hanover kind of areas, northern Germany, you have a load of different types of beers that are simple, but a wheat, a wheat beer in Germany is Bavarian. It is such a traditional Bavarian drink. And it makes sense because if you think about Bavarian agriculture back in the day, it was wheat. There were, you know, Bavaria was the breadbasket of Germany for a very long time. The climate and, the, and what they grew there was wheat. So, you know, that would only naturally make sense that when you've, you know, you have an abundance crop like wheat, what do you make with it? Well, of course, after you've made bread, what else do you do? Naturally, you make beer. And so that's why this Bavarian beer is, and the wheat beer is so strong and has been brewed for so long. I mean, I know that Erding is like 130 years old. I think you said so. But wheat beer has been around, obviously, so much longer than that. You know, like it's one of the oldest for, uh, variations of beer in the world. I mean, we think back to here in the UK, mead, you know, using different, you know, that, that, that was our version of like the UK's version of basically what a wheat beer is. You know, it's using a crop that's abundant here in the UK and you make mead from it. You know, whereas wheat beer is obviously taking the abundant crop in the Bavaria region of wheat and they make a beer from it. It's, I love that kind of link back to what what could have been drunk hundreds if not thousands of years ago one thing i've noticed on their website which i actually i adore this sort of stuff and i think we've talked about it in the past like joe's definitely noticed this in the past is the uh, they've talked about having the right glass for it and they've got this glass that is they've said is tailor-made for wheat their wheat beer um and it's supposedly it's it's like um it's like a super thin 
and it goes out and it like fattens at the top and then slightly narrows as you go um, upwards. And it's the fact that this upper s- spherical shape concentrates the aromas and makes them appear more intensive um, due to the curved shape of the glass. I'll give you an additional fact on that, Simo. So that style of the Erdinger glass is actually a derivative of the German Hafweizen glass, which is the very traditional glass that you would then have these wheat beers in. As you exactly you said, it's kind of thin at the bottom. It kind of is bored. It comes thin at the bottom and then it bulbs out at the very top. So that Erdinger version is obviously the kind of their take on that. You know, like, uh, you know, like all the, all, all great breweries will have their own version, their own glassware, but this is still derived from a very German type of glass called the Hafenweissen. Hafenweissen? I love it. Absolutely love it. So we've talked a lot about the history of Erdinger. We've talked about the history of wheat beers in general. But I need to bring this back to the 21st century <laughs> and their their current work with Jürgen Klopp. The legend that is the Liverpool manager. Who, if I'm honest, I always thought was Dutch for no reason other than his <laughs> last name. But he is through and through German. Oh, he is a German man, and and he is a fantastic, a fantastic gentleman. In just that his like attitude in life oh, is is great. Yeah. Whether you like Liverpool or not, you can like Le- Jurgen Klopp. And Erdinger have teamed up with Jurgen Klopp to do a whole load of promotions lately. I don't know. You're looking at me through the screen like you're not sure about this, and I can tell you it is definitely working. Erdinger in the UK have gone full into having their celebrity endorsement by Jürgen Klopp. That is amazing. So they have released an Erb- Erdinger Weissbier in a celebration can, which has Jürgen Klopp's face and signature plastered no all over way. it. way! That is epic! They have a whole advert campaign right now, which is mostly being pushed through YouTube, which has, uh, basically, the bar is set, okay? I'm setting you guys the scene of this advert, okay? So, you have a bar... Back in the day when people could go into bars in the UK. And you have up on the screen, uh, you know, you have uh, Jurgen Klopp sat at the bar and there's a barman pulling a pint of Erdinger into one of the special Erdinger glasses. Okay. You have up on the back screen a, lo- a crowd of people in the bar watching a Liverpool game. And it looks like it's like they're close to scoring. Like, you know, there's a couple of passes. Yeah, they're yeah. closer towards the box. And, you know, it then cuts back to Jurgen Klopp and he says, stop. This is my great German accent I'm doing now. Yeah. Stop. And, and everyone turns around as if he's saying stop to the football. Like, what? Like, you went to watch Liverpool win. Like, what are you doing? And he's like, don't cut the head off the, off the, off the Erdinger. <laughs> you never cut the head off the Erdinger. <laughs> so like the Dutch version of the white beers. And we talked about the kind of the skim off the top, mm. the, the Erdingers and the German style beer. You never cut the top off the head. Mm. Like, you leave it, be all full of foam. You let that come out and you just try it. And actually, there was a nice outtake that they actually put on the end of the advert of Jurgen Klopp. who was like saying, it's actually a pretty good beer. He was like commenting on how it's a good beer. So uh, I do feel like it's a, you know, it's obviously it's an advert. So I always take all of that with a grain of salt. But it adds a lot more personality to this very German beer that we have. Uh, we've not really heard of too much before, but we've known the name, but we haven't really had too much of a brand personality in the past. I think, to be fair, that's a really clever way to get it out there because with someone like Klopp, who is so likeable in a sport that is so popular, it's only going to help the brand. Like, it's only going to help. And also, with him being so current at the moment, because he is so liked and so loved everywhere, and Liverpool being a group... Like, let's be honest, Liverpool Football Club is a global... Like, people always forget that football club has become global. And their name is a brand, and people forget that it's just a company, essentially. Like... Football, go- like the fact that it that will go everywhere, and Klopp is liked everywhere. Like the the one thing that I think that Klopp Klopp has is that likable factor, which makes you think that this beer is likable. Do you see what I mean? As in, it instantly links you with a likable beer, and I think that's really clever. Well, well, it also he is a likable person, but it gives a personality to the brand. Which let's face it, brands are unless they you know they're a brand, they're a company, they're an organization. You know, so they're always looking for ways of humanizing a brand, personifying a brand. And I think Jurgen Klopp for them, obviously, if you have a, a celebrity endorsement, that becomes your personification. Think about other, other celebrities that have endorsed brands and what you think about them. Nescafe, George Clooney, 
You know, they are so linked now that actually Nescafe has taken on the, or George Clooney's personality has become an, in part of Nescafe. Uh, who else you've got? You've got obviously Ryan Reynolds with all of his, you know, he's got aviator gin. Like that is the through and through Ryan Reynolds, yeah, yeah, that yeah. aviator gin and how he markets it. Um, so celebrity endorsements can do a, an amazing job. Uh, at giving a brand a personality. And I think Erdinger, this is a great case because obviously it's a company that's been around for a very, very long time, but they've made it relevant for normal audiences. One celebrity endorsement gone wrong that I will tell you about. Do you know the show um, Jersey Shore? Yes. yes. Unfortunately. Look, yes, exactly. So there was a guy on there called The Situation. So that's what he referred to himself. And he was the... Was his name The Situation? Or that was his nickname? No, no, as in he called himself. No, he called himself The Situation. Yeah, he was called Mike The Situation. I've forgotten his last name, but it was something like an Italian-American at the end of it. And I already hate and him. He, <laughs> he would always like take his top off. He was bright orange because of the tan, bright yellow hair, and he had an eight-pack. So he was in amazing shape, but he knew about it, and he was all bravado. Anyway, he used to wear Hollister clothing and Abercrombie & Fitch clothing specifically all the time. And Abercrombie and Fitch that tried to pay him to not wear their clothes anymore because of the brand association. <laughs> that is brilliant. That is absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Celebrity endorsements. They can work and they can really backfire at the same time. I want to talk about the taste because for me, this is the most... I cannot compare this to a lager. I can't compare this to a craft ale. I can't compare it to ale. This is something so unique, yet brilliant at the same time. I love this. Why don't you compare it to a wheat beer? Yeah, wheat beer, I was going to say. I can't compare an elephant to an orange. Like, it just doesn't work. But see, I know what you're saying. Like, basically, trying to compare it with different kind of beers that we have already, and you've got a lot of frame of reference to, but a wheat beer is through and through a wheat beer. Like, it is so different to anything else. I haven't had many wheat beers in my life, right? I don't I don't generally go out and try and find them. I don't, I don't think they're that accessible where we are. But I love what we're having now. I think it is a genuinely amazing good taste, and it feels like I can have it. This feels sessionable to me. This feels... Um, interesting enough that I would have more than one. I don't feel like this is something that's trying to be unique in terms of it's not trying to be quirky or wacky. It's a fantastic wheat beer. Well, that's what, like I was saying, like the only other time I think I've tried a wheat beer was when I was in Amsterdam with Joe. Um, but this is, this is definitely a different style. It definitely tastes different to, to the, to the one that, that I have, and for love nor money, can I remember the name of that beer? It tasted, it was fantastic, whatever it was, it was wonderful. But this, Erdinger, as, as a wheat beer, and I, I don't have a massive comparison to go on, but if all wheat beers that I try from now on are based around the Erdinger flavour, the texture and how smooth and nice it goes down, I am sold on wheat beer sort of thing. I don't think it's something I'm going to go out and regularly buy, but it's definitely something that I've, if it's there and I can try it, I definitely will. Um, One thing that I've... I was actually thinking about when I've actually tried wheat beers before. And on a beer 52, they sent me a pack and there was about three or four wheat beers in there. And I had those and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm not a big fan. But this is so, this is much smoother than those. And the taste isn't as abstract or it doesn't affect, like, I don't want to say the word offend me, but like, it feels like this is a lot smoother than the other wheat beers I've had in the past. So I think in, in similar vein in that we're finding like there's a craft, craft beer resurgence in general. We always tend to think of IPAs, double IPAs, you know, the kind of the craft ales as being the thing that's been having. But that's just the, the European or the kind of the English, American, Nordic countries that are absolutely loving IPAs at the moment. But if you look into Germany and Poland and, you know, and, and the countries around that, like they are having a huge craft resurgence on wheat beers mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. So you can have the same variety in wheat beers as you're having in other lagers now and you're having in IPAs and APAs. And I would just say that Erdinger is obviously through and through a traditional wheat beer. You know, it's a very palatable. It's got so much flavor to it. And if you haven't had an Erdinger before, I would definitely highly recommend if you're a fan of light beers, try it. Definitely throw your ring, ring into that. Have it cold as it's intended, you know, in its proper temperature. Have it in a glass because why not? If you can get yourself on one of the, the special um, German Hyphenweissen beer glasses, then do it. But if not, just put it in a chalice like I'm doing and it is delicious. 
you literally made me realize I had a beer 52 Polish edition and that's where I had the wheat beer. And Joe is completely right. There are so many different wheat beers you can try. And I would say from the ones I've had in Poland compared to this one, this one is honestly top notch. So you, you've you tried the Erdinger, but but have you heard of the the Erdinger isotonic drink? No. <laughs> so I am from the very start worried about this. So we are trying. We also have the Erdinger. We cannot rave enough about this wheat beer. And if please do try the, the Erdinger Weiss beer, the traditional one. And they have a load of different other beers. So this is not just Erdinger's. Like they're not a one trick pony. They have loads of different ones. But they have recently released an alcohol free or alcohol fry, which is German. That's my German accent. That, 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 was, that was perfect. Simo. I, I am intrigued because they refer to it as an isotonic, contains vit- vitamins, reduced calories on the label. But you found out something a bit more interesting about how they're describing this beer. They're calling it the Sporty Thirst Quencher. Now, it is claiming, it is claiming that it supports the regeneration process, whatever that means, right? It also only has 25 calories per 100 milliliters, which is actually pretty decent. That's really good, yeah. Isotonic and contains vitamins B9 and B12. Basically, these are, um, they promote the normal functioning of the immune system. So it's the idea that it it will help against um, the idea of disease or getting infections and viruses, which is awesome, right? However, it is kind of claiming now with the advert as well, that if you go for a run or if you are cycling or whatever, you should drink an Erdinger isotonic drink which is now obviously isotonic drinks you can get so you can actually buy isotonic drinks that are like you know from lucas aid or whatever and they're supposed to do these things now i just find it completely intriguing that they are claiming that this beer has all of these factors it's amazing we, we, we talked about it before in the past that we joked that you should have non-alcoholic beers and like an infinite session ale after a hard workout you should neck one of these beers but like these guys are literally saying that you should have it as you're running along which what okay so 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 i've only recently got into running in the past six months or so some may say i can run 10k i can it's a fact it's all right jesus it's <laughs> Again, it sounded so natural how you said that. Just naturally came out. Rich Rabble can run 10k. What a guy. But it's, uh, but, um, but I would not want to swig this on my journey round anywhere. If I, it's just. In all honesty, I haven't even sniffed it. I've just opened the top of the bottle yet and I'm going to try and try and sniff a bit of this now. So let me give you my immediate nose on this. Whilst Joe sniffs, one thing I will say is that I find it highly intriguing that they're, that, the way that they've they've linked this to athleticism and sports, it's kind of it's very new. Like I've never heard that before. It's very intriguing. It's kind of like, are you saying that it's the same? That what? Interestingly, they're saying that the bitterness. Now, this is this is one of the first companies that have done this. So they put the two bottles in. They're slightly different colours, but on the back they describe them as the same. Right, we've seen that, and all of us have gone. Well, that's not true. Yeah, so like Doom Bar, Doom Bar do it, and uh, Gross Ship do it as well. In that sense, yeah. However, this, this time I've looked on their website. They instantly have put the bitterness from mild all the way nearly top bar to like completely bitter. They haven't changed the color, which is fair because the color doesn't necessarily have to change. But they're saying that it is far more bitter. And you're talking specifically, so you're talking specifically about the colour of the liquid, right? Yeah. So the colour of the liquid doesn't change. However, the bitterness between, so the normal one is not bitter, and they're saying that this one is completely hundred percent more bitter. So I like the fact that they have acknowledged the difference, but I want to now try it. So I am intrigued because uh, going back to what you were saying about before, it's an, it, they clearly label isotonic. It contains vitamins. The fact that they're even outwardly saying that it links with, like, that you should have it with sport. It's like you're having a sports drink. These are very, very unusual wordings and phrases to use with a beer. You know, I know this is their 0.5% or less than, no more than 0.5%. So, you know, this is definitely their kind of, like, alcohol-free version. But this is unusual of a beer company or a beer in general to be, or a beer-related drink to be talking in this kind of language. So this is unusual for, like, consumers. We don't know this in a sense. We're thinking of, like, heavy Lucozade isotonic drinks. We're talking about, like, sugar gel, fructose syrup, 
slow release carbohydrate stuff. We're looking for these kind of things when you're talking about sh- sports drink. So they are trying to play in that kind of sports drink category, but this is a beer. So I feel like this is a, as, as we would say, this is the bridge over the river Kwai. This is a bridge too far. You know, I feel like we're going into a category now where this beer company is trying to play in like we're doing more vitamins for you. We're better for you. We're healthier. And as a rule of thumb, beer companies cannot do that kind of language. That is not appropriate for beer companies to do because at the end of the day, it's an alcohol derivative drink. This is, this has got alcohol in it. So you wouldn't, you can't claim that it's better for you. It's, you know, it, beer companies as, as a rule of thumb in advertising, you steer cl- well clear of any of these kind of claims because you open yourself up to a quagmire of liabilities and lawsuits and potential things because people can say, well, I drank your beer for, you know, five years and I didn't get healthier. So, you know, what are you saying? It's like what happened with Red Bull. And their famous catchphrase of Red Bull gives you wings. A, a guy in the States sued them for a lot of money because he said, well, you say Red Bull gives you wings and I've never grown wings. I've drunk this uh, this drink for the last five years and I haven't dr- grown wings. It's preposterous, but you open yourself up to those kind of li- like ridiculous liabilities if you make such a statement. So I feel like I'm a bit worried by Erdinger's non-alcoholic or alcohol-free by making such claims about isotonic and and uh, vitamin contained vitamin stuff in that it's kind of and they're saying that you should pair it with sports so overtly because even like Michelob Ultra which is through and through paired with sports in the US does not say you should run a marathon and be drinking Michelob Ultra while you're doing it I'll say about the taste is it's definitely bitter it is definitely more bitter like there is like regardless of the taste like of the rest of it, it is definitely bitter in in aspect of when you drink it. However, it's not the worst non-alcoholic beer I've tasted. We've tried a lot of non-alcoholic beer in the past two months. Like the most I've ever tried in my life has been in these past two months. Um, and this this is this is up there with one of the better tasting ones. One that I I'm not opposed to drinking. One that I would not be opposed to drink again. So the thing, we, we, we've tried non-alcoholic beers that I would downright refuse to ever try again because they were just, they were just awful. They were not a good representation, but this, this, this is a tasty, low alcoholic op- offering. So I would say that I would put this Erdinger alcohol free. It is not a cl- very close representation of the Erdinger beer. The Erdinger Weiss beer specifically is very nice, but this is a very palatable German style on an alcohol-free beer. And the last German-style beer that we tried that was alcohol-free was Lucky Saint. And I can quite honestly say this is so much more palatable than Lucky Saint. Um, I, I would definitely say, though, that I can tell that this is Erdinger. Now, it, it, it sounds a bit daft to say that, as in like... No, I don't think you're wrong there. I completely no, yeah. agree with you, Simone. As in, as in like, I feel like that with a lot of non-alcoholic stuff we've tried in the past, you've gone, what the hell is this? This does not represent the, con- the, the um, not country, <laughs> the, um, the company. This does not represent the company. This is completely false. When I drink this, I'm like, it kind of tastes like Erdinger. It's not as good. Like, don't get me wrong. Like the alcoholic version does taste better, but I can, t- when I'm drinking this, I'm like, it got that essence. It's got that essence of Erdinger in it. And I think a lot of those other companies that we've talked about in the past have not done that. What what it really has is got that wheaty hit. I can taste the wheat in Erdinger and I can also taste the wheat in the Erdinger non-alcoholic, which I think is a big bonus. In a lot of the other non-alcoholics, I couldn't get that hoppy taste that I get from the other beers, that, that feel that it feels like a beer. If I was to drink Erding a non-alcoholic and somebody was to tell me it was alcoholic, I would be on board with it sort of thing. I'd be like, yes, I can taste it, I can feel it, and I know and I know it's there sort of thing. And I think that is a big bonus and a big tick in the general direction for the Erdinger that they've done something right. It's not quite Erdinger, as I say, full fat. It's not quite Erdinger all the alcoholic, but it is definitely Erdinger and it's something palatable something nice and definitely something I could go for again. I agree I think this is a great uh, you know the only thing we question obviously about this is the fact that it's it's calling itself an isotonic you know beer just because that's unusual. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, if it like genuinely speaking, right? If it has the things in it, yes, great. But I wouldn't if you're if you're an athlete, I wouldn't go right. Let's drink this instead of just water. Just water is better. So I also love. I've just I'm, I'm going to do the numbers on on Twitter social media, but I've literally just clicked onto their Twitter and their banner is like the Erdinger can, uh, sorry, can, the, the bo- which I've never seen before, the bottle, which is the one we have, which is fantastically blue and lovely, uh, you know, and a glass of it. But the tagline is the refreshing isotonic recovery drink. Wow. So they're like, okay. they're not they're not even saying like, oh, this is an alcoholic free version of their beer. They just say this should be used as like a sports recovery drink. Can someone, can, fact, fact checker, can you quickly Google to see if there's any actual scientific evidence that Erdinger is backing up the fact that they are an, a, a recovery drink? Because this is, that's, they can't make those kind of statements unless they've got a fact behind it. If you put things like B9 and B12 into your drink, like if you are actually putting those vitamins in there... Like they technically are useful in terms of your immune system. So like you can't, it's, it, it depends what you see as a recovery, because obviously the idea is like those vitamins are useful. Like don't get me, like if you have those vitamins, they are going to help your immune system. Which, however, having them within alcohol, I have no idea if that is actually beneficial or not. Well, let, let me put this in perspective in that how this is not like associated with a normal beer. I've gone onto Twitter, I've followed them, and it also has suggested what you also might like on Twitter. And the two two Twitter pages that have come up are UK Cycle, Cycle Chat TM and UK Run Chat TM. So this beer this beer company has created a beer that's that they're positioning as a refreshing recovery drink. And that has hit with all the algorithms. And this is just shows how weird this, this whole situation is, is that they're now being paired on people's search bars and in the, the other pages that they could be related to in fitness and, you know, kind of like sports. So I, I really think that Erdinger has to be either publishing or have to be saying that this is actually isotonic and better for them, uh, than, than they are because that is crazy. So on Twitter, they have, uh, 6,000 followers on, Instagram, they have 11,000 followers. I mean, I would definitely say, I would definitely say Erdinger is just, ha- you have to have a go. You have to try it. Um, and I think that you have to try the, non- the non-alcoholic the non version as well with it. I just think it's worth a punt. I also think it's not a bad non-alcoholic version, as Rich was saying. Oh, yeah, 100%. I think it's a great, it's a, it's a really nice non-alcoholic drink and it's a nice drink also as well. You know, when I've been out for a long run, I'll probably grab one and try to put it to the test as a recovery drink. Rich, maybe your next 10k, you'll have a couple of Erdingers afterwards. Recovery! And that's all we have time for from this week's episode of the I'll Try That podcast. And so from me, Joe, Rich, and Simo, goodbye. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and watch us on YouTube. Goodbye now. Always drink responsibly, and if you or anyone else needs some help, go to drinkaware.co.uk for more information. Mm-hmm.